All right. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, last class for this week. So this week we will be done after tonight. So we'll pick back up to finish up everything next week. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's jump on into the material uh, so we can get through it and keep moving along. So tonight we're going to basically be discussing the conveyance of title. How exactly title is going to be transferred from one individual to another. Okay. And we use the term conveyance uh, to basically state this. And so in that situation, we're going to be covering this evening different uh, learning objectives uh, that we will be ending up going through. Uh, but in this particular situation, the ones that we're going to be covering for this evening are going to ultimately be number one, list the basic requirements for a valid deed. Number two, describe the most common types of deeds. Number three, we want to illustrate how transfer tax may be assessed on a conveyance of property. And number four, we're going to explain how property may be transferred through voluntary and involuntary alienation, including a discussion of what's called adverse possession. We also will explain the difference in someone dying, what's called testate and intestate and also the effect of potential heirs. We will further review the legal requirements for making a will. We'll identify the purpose and procedures of probate, explain the importance of recording documents in the public record, and describe what's either called constructive or actual notice. Lastly, we will distinguish between the chain of title and abstract of title. We'll review the process and purpose of a title search. We'll further discuss the way to show proof of ownership. And we'll compare what is included in the title insurance policies. So the very first thing that we're going to start off with this evening, so we're going to start off with what's called the right to ownership, OK? And how we show that right to ownership. Title, like we've said before, is transferred amongst, when we're dealing with this situation, title is transferred from the aspect of an individual ends up, they own, uh, say, real estate, they get title, but they get title through a deed, okay? So the conveyance, the actual transference that's going to occur is going to occur by a deed, all right, and if you recall the first uh, earlier section uh, from when we first had class at the very beginning, uh, we discussed title and transferring and ownership uh, and how we do this. Now, if it is real estate, we're going to transfer it by a deed. If it is going to be personal property, we transfer it by a what's called receipt, okay, or a bill of sale. So in that particular situation, when we're talking about title, we're talking about the transference of ownership to another individual. And in this particular situation, the person that holds title is going to ultimately hold the ownership of that particular title or of that property. Now, like I said, we do not have an actual form that's called title, okay? It's called a deed. So we do not actually use or have a title, we're actually giving it through proof of ownership through the deed that's filed with the county. And we'll talk about that further as we're proceeding. Now, how exactly do we transfer property? How exactly do we go about transferring property to another individual? Well, in order to do that, one of the methods that is often utilized is voluntary alienation. And the word voluntary, as you can see, basically means in this particular situation is that we are offering on our own. We are offering our, on our own to transfer ownership to another, okay? So we are transferring ownership to another voluntarily. And because of this, there is no adverse relation, 
okay? There is nobody that's going over here and adversely uh, basically messing with the transfer. So in this particular situation, voluntary alienation is the voluntary transfer of title. So through a sale or gift, and the deed conveys property from a grantor to a grantee. Now it is imperative that you understand these differences. A grantor is gonna be an individual that is actually the one that is selling the property, okay? So in this particular situation, a grantor is gonna be an individual that is the seller. They're the one that is transferring or giving away their, their interest in the property. A grantee is gonna be the individual that is purchasing. So the individual that is owning or purchasing the property is going to be the grantee, okay? So if they are, if the seller is selling their property, they go in, they sell their property, what's ending up happening in this particular situation is, is they go over, they say, you know what? I'm selling my property. I am voluntarily putting it on the market for sale. And because I'm putting it on the market for sale, I am not being adversely taken advantage of or pushed to sell it. So I am basically giving my property away to the person that can end up paying the price that we agree on. Very important on that. So when we're talking about transferring property and there's alienation, we're talking about transference in a situation of we are giving away ownership voluntarily without any undue burden. Now, for you to transfer the property, to give it away to somebody, you have to, in this aspect, you have to have certain requirements of your deed, okay? So your deed has to meet certain elements for it to be fully transferred, okay? And to do that, the grantor, which as we have learned, the grantor is the seller, so the grantor must be the one who has legal competency to execute and sign the deed. If they are not competent, they cannot sign a deed, period. No ifs, ands, buts about it. They have to be legally competent to execute a deed. So if an individual is, say, 17, 16 years of age, they would be unable to be a grantor in an execution of a deed because of the fact is in this situation is they are a minor. And if they are a minor, what ends up happening in this particular situation is they end up, they cannot, they're unable to meet the legal competency requirement. So in that particular situation, they have to be competent and to meet that competency, they have to be of age. Now, so we see the first off is that the grantor has to have legal competency to sign or execute the deed. Now, the grantee is the one that's gonna be named with reasonable certainty to be identified. So in this situation, a grantee is gonna be someone with reasonable certainty, they will end up being identified. Now, if we're selling our property, the grantor is most likely going to have the name of the person that's purchasing the property. That's pretty basic information, okay? So if, for example, that Keith, I know Keith and he's purchasing my property, of course, I'm gonna put Keith's name because I know Keith. So in that situation, Keith's name will be put into the deed and he would end up being basically the new owner. He's a grantee. So you have to, though, have reasonable certainty. Okay, and what we're talking about in this situation is let's say, for example, that Mr. Keith has ended up, I've placed him in my uh, deed as the grantee. Uh, I execute the deed. And key thing here, if you want to put a note to the side, is deeds are never executed by the grantee. The buyer never signs the deed, period. Okay, only the seller. So if I go over here, and I put down that, uh, you know, Mr. Keith, he is getting my property, he purchased my property. And since he purchased my property, what I've ended up doing is uh, Keith has gone over, he's supposed to get it. Well, after I execute it, I send it back to him. I have used reasonable certainty to identify him 
But say, God forbid, Mr. Keith dies. If Mr. Keith dies before he gets the deed, we need reasonable certainty as to who is going to be the next owner. Who's the next person in line? Okay. So in this particular situation, you have to make certain that we're keeping a process of identifying individuals with the best of our ability. Okay. If we're unable to meet with the best of our ability, then we're not going to be able to fully transfer the title. Okay. Now, we also have to give a statement of consideration. Now, this is that key point that is very important. And Mr. Colton, I'm glad you're here this evening because you kind of probably missed the earlier one. But I don't know if we've talked about it or not. Did we ever talk when you were in here? Did we ever talk about for love and affection? Did I ever discuss it? No. Okay. So what happens, Mr. Colton, in this situation is, and for those that have missed it, there has to be consideration for it to be a valid lease, meaning that there has to be some benefit. So if I'm ending up selling my property to you, okay, for it to be classified as a sale, I have to benefit out of something. Okay, there has to be fair exchange here. Now, if I go over and I say, let's say that you were my son, for example, and I go over in this situation and I want you to have my property. Okay. If you're my child, should you have to pay me money for my property? You shouldn't have to, right? No. So under consideration is, while well, most of the time it's going to be cash, what happens here is you can, in some situations, put for love and affection, that's what I'm benefiting out of. You're my child. I've got to watch you grow up. I'm seeing you flourish. That is my love and affection. So I'm giving you my property. I'm selling you my property in exchange for you being my child. Do you kind of see how that works? Same thing in the situation is if you end up, say that, uh, you know, your wife ends up, you buy some property. And in this particular situation, your wife buys some property and she wants to give it to you, Colton. You don't want to have to have, you don't want to have to pay your wife for it. You want to be able to just transfer it through love and affection. OK, so love and affection can be a method of consideration. However, Garrett, question for you. Can you end up or can earnest money ever be considered consideration? Uh, no, sir. That is correct. Earnest money can never be classified as consideration, period. OK. So in that situation, they will ask you on the state exam, earnest money can be classified as consideration. That is false. Okay. Earnest money is to show a serious intent. That's it. All right. It's not meant to be for the consideration. All right. Now, there also has to be a granting clause within the deed. All right. So if we have who the party is and we're competent and we have money, well, we still need to have the what's called the words of conveyance so that we can convey our interest, all right? We need to be able to convey our interest. And to do that, we have to use a granting clause. We have to go in here and we have to grant our rights to another individual. So if I say to Mr. Grossman, uh, Mr. Grossman, you gave me $100,000 for my land. I am hereby granting my property or my interest my life, my rights, my duties and interests to Mr. Grossman. Because of the fact is in this situation is Mr. Grossman is now going to be the one that has paid for those rights and those duties. And if you recall, Mr. Grossman, what was the very beginning of this class? What did we end up talking about earlier? Do you remember what we talked about earlier in regards to, it's called a bundle of what? A bundle, of rights. bundle of rights. So when I sell my property, I need to transfer that bundle of rights to who? If I'm selling it to you, who do I need to send it to? No, I need to send it to you because you're buying the property, right? So I need to transfer through my granting clause, the bundle of rights, okay? Now, another one is what we call the habendum clause. And the habendum clause is to define ownership that's taken by the grantee. So after I grant it, 
we have to have a way that you're accepting it. Okay, so I am transferring my interest, but through the habendum calls, we're defining the ownership in which you're taking. Okay, two separate clauses, they will test you on two separate clauses. Don't get those mixed together there. Okay. Now, also in our deed, we have to have accurate legal description of the property that's being conveyed. We have to make certain that the legal description that we're giving is actually correct. Um, Mr. Keith, question for you, sir. Um, is the street address classified as the legal description? No, sir. That is correct. The street address is never going to be classified as the legal description. So when you're filling out a deed and it asks for the legal description, you do not put 123 Main Street, College Station, Texas, 77845. Okay. You're going to put lot two, block four of the Ann Hiver um, estate and located in Brazos County, Texas. City College Station seven or you won't put the, the zip code, but you would put College Station Texas, and that's it. So your mailing address is never ever going to be your legal description. Period. Okay. And if you do put it as that, all you've just told the person that's purchasing your property is that they're purchasing your mailbox. Okay. We don't want that. They're not. Do you want to pay Colton uh, two hundred fifty thousand for a mailbox? No, nobody wants to do that. So in that particular situation, you wanna make certain that you're being accurate in your legal description. The next one, we wanna make certain that the legal, basically relevant exceptions or reservations, if there's anything that the current grantor, the seller is going to keep, then I wanna make certain that as I do this, that if I'm gonna keep certain things, I need to put those in the deed. So I may end up keeping well, let's, let me test this out here. Mr. Eugene, what's one thing that if I'm a seller, what's one thing that I might want to keep if I'm selling property, but what's something I might want to keep if I'm mineral selling? Rights. What is that? Mineral rights. mineral rights. Why would I want to keep mineral rights? Yeah, they're going to be oil or, or even precious metals underneath there. So I may no longer want the land in the house, but I may want the oil underneath it. Okay. So in that situation is, you need to put any exceptions or reservations that you're gonna keep, okay? Uh, of course, at the bottom, you have to have the signature of the grantor. And here's the key thing, it has to be acknowledged. They're not gonna put the word notarized on there. So they're gonna say, the, the grantor must sign the deed in front of who? Or must sign the acknowledgement in front of who? And then they'll put judge, County clerk, uh, notary public, real estate broker. Well, it's going to be the notary public. Okay. So in that situation, it has to be in front of, it has to be acknowledged in front of a notary. Okay. And what that acknowledgement means is we're making certain that, Colton, if you're signing over your rights, we want to make certain that you are who you are, if you see what I'm saying. And when we talked a little earlier about being competent, it's the duty of the notary to make certain that you're competent. Do you see where that comes in? So when you go in to get notarized, a notary's job is not simply to just take your driver's license and look and be like, yeah, that looks like him, sign. No, no, no. Our job is to kind of look at it and then say, do you understand what you're doing? Do you understand the process? You're giving away your property. Do you understand everything within the terms of this? And if you say yes, 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 and we feel that you're competent, we'll notarize it. But if we kind of get a feeling that like you're drunk, you're high or something like that, we'll refer, refuse to acknowledge your document. And I've had that happen before. When I was signing or notarizing somebody's paper, a guy came in, <clears throat> his eyes were bloodshot, he smelt of alcohol very strongly, and he wanted to come in and, and have me notarize his deed. And he was selling it because he said he lost the bet. Okay, well, do you think he was in his right mind most likely, Colton? No, not, not at all. So in that situation, I had to turn him away. He wasn't happy, but I'm not notarizing something and he come to his senses tomorrow and be like, what the heck just happened and then come sue me. 
okay? Rather you be mad at me than come and sue me, okay? So again, we have to acknowledge we have that duty. Now, one thing I wanna end up, and y'all might wanna put a note to the side here, because I used a little trick question there. I said, if it says a county clerk or a notary public, truthfully in that answer, it would most likely be either the county clerk or the notary public, okay? Because oftentimes county clerks are designated as notaries, okay? So in that situation, you have to watch your questions. And the reason I bring that up is because sometimes you'll see where they talk about acknowledgement and you won't see notary public anywhere. And the only option on there will be a county clerk. And if they say that, that is most likely the best answer. So when we're talking about these things, we're talking about the county clerk, and that's gonna be the person that can notarize. Now, the last and most important part, because most people stop right here at bullet number three, they forget about bullet number four here. They just think, especially when it comes to a test question, they forget that we have to what? Mr. Eugene, what's that say? That bottom, bottom bullet, please, sir. Exactly, we have to deliver that deed and we have to have acceptance by the buyer, which is the grantee, to pass the title. Just because you went, Mr. Eugene, we say that you're selling your property to Mr. Jacob and you go over, Mr. Eugene, and you sign your deed and you filled it out, you notice Mr. Jacob has nowhere on here that he needs to sign. Seller does not, or buyer does not ever sign. Mr. Jacob goes in and he, you know, he's like, okay, I'm buying your property. And he gives you cash, you sign your stuff and you put it on your desk and you go off for a Christmas vacation. Well, it's still not classified as a transferred deed because you've not delivered it to the person that has purchased it. Okay, extremely, extremely important in that situation. We've harped on that and harped on that and harped on that. And I do that simply because the fact is the test will catch you on these people. You'd be surprised how many people they'll read a question and they get right here to signature and they'll say, well, I just got to sign and then it's done. They forget this last bullet right here. And when they forget that last bullet, you're pretty much up creek without a paddle, okay? Now, what are our types of deeds? Now, I'm gonna spend a little time on this. And I know this may be boring for y'all and y'all probably all ready to, to call it quits for the week. But let me tell you, what I'm about to talk about here on this one is gonna be one of the largest, largest sections of your licensing exam, okay? And it's funny because of the fact is, is they spend a lot of time focusing on this, yet you can't draft the deeds. That's what's horrible. So there's different types of deeds. And I'm gonna kind of go through this real quick. So we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna go through real quick, show you the types of deeds, and then we're gonna come back and talk about them. So the first one is your general warranty deed. Your next one is gonna be what's called your special warranty deed. Your third one is your bargain and sell deed. And your last one is your quick claim deed. So Mr. Eugene, how many uh, deeds are there? No, sir. Four. There's four. General warranty, statutory, or basically statutory warrant, uh, deed, your bargain and sell, and your quick claim, okay? Statutory often means special warranty, kind of similar. Uh, we'll talk about those in just a second. But the one we're going to talk the most important on is going to be your general warranty deed. Most important, biggest one of them all. Because of the fact is you do not want to normally buy property without a general warranty deed. Okay, and I'll explain why. So a general warranty deed is going to be your greatest protection to the buyer. All right, it is the greatest, it's the largest protection to you. So if you're purchasing property, you want general warranty deed, period. Okay, sometimes that won't happen. Most of the time, that's what you're shooting for. Now, you'll notice that there's different covenants that are within the general warranty deed. The first covenant deals with basically, it's the grantor's warrant that they own the property and have the right to convey title. So when we talk about covenant, think of it from this way. How many of you ever bought a, a vehicle and you ended up, you got a warranty with it? 
quoting on yours recent ones you get a warranty on yours yep Stefan, warranty what's the reason mr grossman that you get a warranty on your vehicle in case something happens you don't want to pay the headaches with it right you don't want to deal with all of that stuff so in this particular situation a covenant is kind of like a warranty okay but the warranty is coming from who is the warranty coming from the seller the seller is warranting that in this particular situation remember anytime we talk about grand tours we're talking about the seller so the seller warrants that they own the property and they have the right to convey it so they're saying i own this property and i can transfer it period okay the second one is the covenant against encumbrances so it's the seller is warranting that the property is free of any liens or encumbrances except for any specifically stated ones in the deed okay so in this particular situation a covenant against encumbrances is that they are saying there are no other people that have an interest in my property at all period are no other people that have interest in my property except for the ones that i told you when i ended up selling my property now question mr garrett in this particular situation so i got a question for you um where exactly do we find out in regards to what exactly the seller has for liens or encumbrances where do we find this information where do you think you find this information um remember us talking the other day about a title something you remember what that was a title search do you remember that oh yeah yeah okay once a title search is done they issue the title company issues you what do you remember what that document's called after a title search is done i do not it's called a title commitment okay a title commitment in this particular situation is the form that actually goes in here and it stipulates that the property is free from any liens or encumbrances except for those stipulated within the deed or the title commitment okay so the title commitment in this particular situation it basically breaks down the ownership okay and who has what so if i want it to say for example uh, Mr. Eugene, I could go down to Brazos County. I could go into the county clerk's office or the deed records office. I can walk in there and I can start doing some searches. I can look at who'd you buy the property from, if they have it recorded, how much mortgage, who your lien holder is. I can also end up finding in some situations, I can find out if you have any other liens that are filed, maybe a mechanic lien, maybe you had a a pool put in your backyard and you never paid Mr. Colton for the pool he put in, okay? I can find out all of this stuff by just going through the deed records. I can look through title. I can go through it and see. It's called my chain of title. What ends up happening in this situation is that we go through and we're checking to make certain that there is no liens or encumbrances other than what Mr. Nobles has told us. Now, if we find something in here and y'all will deal with this in real life so i'm gonna this kind of hopefully will wake you up for a minute and i'm gonna give you a, a real life example okay so there will be times that you'll go in client finds a property and either or if you're the seller or the buyer it doesn't matter but either or you find a property client is in love okay uh mr grossman he uh comes to mr eugene says, let me sell your property. Mr. Eugene says, wonderful. Say, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll let you sell my property. Mr. Grossman is stoked. He got his first listing. He says, I'm so glad. Mr. Grossman goes, puts it on the MLS. He asks Mr. Eugene, is there any debts or anything? No, no, I don't have any debts. Everything's old and clear. Mr. Uh, 
Mr. Jacob comes in and he puts an offer in on the property. And after he puts an offer in, he gets a couple of days later from title that your ownership, Mr. Grossman, of your client, his interest in the property is that he actually has four different liens that are on the property from different people. So now, guess what happens? The property is now not free and clear to transfer, meaning that transfer cannot occur. So what happens is, Mr. Grossman, because they're not going to email Mr. Eugene, they're going to send it to you, okay? Unless, and there's a stipulation to that, and we'll talk about that. But what will happen is, they email it to you, Mr. Grossman. you got to go talk to Mr. Eugene and say, Mr. Eugene, uh, title just did a search, and you owe four different liens. You owe four different debts. What are you talking about here? Okay. What happens is, in this situation, is, is it's now Mr. Grossman has to work with title and Mr. Eugene to get those cleared up before the time of the contract lapses. So here's the biggest thing. This is one of those things that hopefully will wake y'all up and keep you going, okay? This has occurred before, okay? And this is why it's imperative when you're completing a contract. You never, when they talk about, there's a provision we will talk about in the contract when we get to, uh, when we get to contract forms and addenda. There's a paragraph that's called notices, okay? And oftentimes it'll say, to seller, dot, dot, and a blind. So Mr. Grossman goes in and puts Mr. Eugene and puts Mr. Eugene's phone number, Mr. Eugene's email, Mr. Eugene's fax number, okay? Now, if you know Mr. Eugene, do you think Mr. Eugene checks his email religiously in most situations? No, not at all. So, Let's say in this situation, Mr. Grossman doesn't put down Mr. Eugene, or put his info, he puts Mr. Eugene. Mr. Eugene gets that email that there are those links. Mr. Grossman doesn't follow up with it because he does not follow up with it. Guess what happens? It now can end up, if it's not resolved within a certain period of time, there can be a breach of contract, okay? So when we're dealing with these different situations, we have to make certain, we have to make certain, the biggest and most important part that we have to be cl uh, clear on is this, is it is our duties when you're representing a client, it is our duty to make certain that guess what, that Mr. Eugene is not the one that's responsible. Too many realtors, too many realtors simply put their client's information in the notices their clients get the information, never give it to their agent. The agent never knows about anything. And sure enough, guess what happens? There is a breach of contract or somebody bags out because the agent knows nothing. When a realtor is hired, when an agent is hired, your information needs to be put in the notices. Your information needs to be there. And it is your duty to make certain that everything that comes through, you read it and then you send it to your client. That is one of the biggest kickbacks that I see a lot of times in this situation is real estate agents do not do their job. They don't fulfill their duty, okay? It is your job to make certain any and all documents come to you. Now, the next one is what we call the covenant of quiet enjoyment. Now the grantor, which is a seller, is gonna guarantee that the grantee, the buyer's title, will be good against any third parties who might bring court actions to establish superior title to the property. This is a big one, very, very big, because you don't see this one covered in any other deeds, period, okay? The first one we talked about, the grantor is warranting that I have the right to sell this property. The second one is that the seller is warranting that the property is free from any liens or encumbrances. This last one is the biggest and most important one. It's saying that afterwards, if, for example, Mr. Eugene, you sell your property to Mr. Jacob, and Mr. Jacob goes and he gets ready to move in, 
And Mr. Garrett comes over and sues Mr. Jacob and tells Mr. Jacob, wait a minute, that's my property. That's half my property. It is Mr. Eugene's requirement that he will help make Mr. Jacob whole because he's standing up against any third parties that think that they have ownership superior to the deed that was transferred. So when you sell a general warranty deed, you are saying that if anybody else comes into this whole situation, that you as the seller are guaranteeing that guess what? I am the one that actually in this situation was the honest and truthful seller. And therefore I, I'm going to protect you, Mr. Jacob, if Mr. Garrett comes in and says it's mine. Okay, this is a huge, huge covenant. Very big. Because what happens is, and where that comes into play is in this situation, when you're in a very rural country town, you may end up having somebody that a mom or a dad passes away. So, you're in a very rural area. There's a, a dad, let's say, that's still alive. The mom has already passed away, but that couple had, you know, 15 kids. And the dad passes away. There's 15 children. Two of the children go and try to sell the property to another person. That person purchases it. Well, here's the problem. If the property was distributed to be basically equally split among those 15 kids, the ones that got the ownership only got two fifteenths of the total. So if there's somebody that comes back in, they could bring a court action to reverse everything because those people did not have interest that you left out the people that did have the interest. Okay. So in that particular situation, we have to make certain that we keep people alert in regards to these different situations so that they understand that it is their duty, it is their responsibility to make certain that everybody has an interest. And I can tell you, I've dealt with those before. They are a nightmare. I think my largest one I've dealt with was there was 29 children and grandchildren. And we had to hunt down 29 children and grandchildren. It was not fun, okay? It took us over two years to get that thing transferred. So you have to be very careful in that situation. Further, there is what's called a covenant of further assurance. Okay, this is your next warranty. It's where the seller is promising to obtain and deliver any instrument needed to make title good. So if there is something that needs to be taken or needs to be dealt with, Say, for example, that Mr. Grossman is selling his property and we end up finding out that when he ends up purchasing his property, Mr. Keith, you're going over buying his property here. Uh, we find out, I'm your agent, that, uh, oh goodness, Mr. Grossman has a, uh, a, a shed that's on the property line. Mr. Grossman has a shed on a property line. And Mr. Grossman has to end up, in order for it to be cleared, we have to have a certification document from the city in order to make it clear that they won't destroy that shed because of the fact is that it's on the property line, okay? So in that situation is, it would be Mr. Grossman's duty, not Mr. Keith's duty, but Mr. Grossman's duty to obtain and deliver that instrument to the grantee. So that the grantee does not end up being harmed. It's their duty. There's also what's called the covenant of warranty forever. This is where we have the grantor, which is the seller, promises to compensate the grantee for the loss sustained if the title fails at any time in the future. So in that situation, say Mr. Darren here, he lives in, we'll say Huntsville, Texas, and he ends up, he is one of 20 kids, okay? And one of his brothers sells off the property that was his mom's. Well, Mr. Darren goes over in this particular situation, and he basically fights to get his ownership back 
and he's able to revert it back to him. Well, the seller, whoever was a seller, one of his brothers that sold it has to end up, if they use the general warranty deed, they would sustain or have to pay for the sustained loss that the buyer purchased because of the fact is, is that there is the coverage of warranty for forever. So when we're dealing with these situations, we have to make certain that we are protecting individuals. And that's why you wanna make certain you do your due diligence and your clients do their, their inspections and their investigations before they jump in. Whenever I hear of an estate sale, that is a property being sold by an estate, I know I'm gonna be dealing with at least six months worth of headache, okay, period. And let me tell you, if it's an estate sale and you're only gonna make a hundred, or well, there's a hundred thousand is what the total property is worth, it ain't gonna be worth it most of the time. Because the fact is, you're only gonna make, if you're an agent, maybe $1,500 to $2,100 off of that sale, and you're dealing with them for six months. Okay, and sometimes that six months can be longer or shorter. So you wanna be very careful. You always wanna run your numbers to make certain that it's gonna be worth your time. Now, that's the end of the general warranty deed. This next one is called the special warranty deed. And a special warranty deed in this particular situation is going to end up being where the seller received the title and the property was not encumbered during the time that the seller held title, except as noted in the deed. So all the special warranty does is this. I go over, I'm selling my property and I'm given a special warranty deed and I tell uh, Mr. Uh, Jacob, I say, Mr. Jacob, here is, uh, here is a special warranty deed what I'm doing, sir, is I am giving you, I had, I had title, I had an interest in it, but I'm not claiming for basically anything prior to my ownership. I'm saying from the point that I bought it to now, I'm not, I've not encumbered it during my time that I've held title. I'm just transferring my interest and only, my only little five years I owned it, I, I can swear to those five years that I, that's all I did. Okay, I just did my little my little deal and, and that's it. Okay. Well the thing about that is is that's wonderful, but where are the warranties? Okay. This is what I call buying it as is, basically. Okay. You're taking the person's word, and in that particular situation is they're saying that I ended up, I'm putting it out here, okay. Uh, but you're technically, I'm, I've only know what I've done during my time. I don't know what happened previously. I just know for what I did in my time. So the property was not encumbered during the time that the grand tour was held, except for what I stated within my deed. Okay. So in that particular situation, the special warranty deed is an opportunity for individuals to go over here and they transfer ownership without having to make any warranties previously. Now, if you're a seller, this is what you want. I only want to say for my time, I had it, we're good. I don't want to worry about what happened before, I just want my time, okay? But from a buyer, it's kind of like you going down and getting that vehicle, Mr. Grossman, you went down and bought your vehicle, and as you go down there and you get your vehicle, the, the dealer says, well, Mr. Grossman, we bought this at an auction, so, and we've only had it for two days, but in those two days, we took care of it, but that's it. We don't know what the previous owner, Mr. Garrett did to it, and he had it for four years, but for the two days we had it, Mr. Grossman, your, it was taken care of, okay? In that situation is, from a buyer standpoint, not what I wanna hear, not what I wanna hear, okay? So that's your gonna be your special warranty deed. The next one is what we call the bargain and sell deed, okay? And the bargain and sell deed, so if you see in here, if you're getting, seeing a pattern, what's happening is this. The very first one in the situation is the, the general warranty deed, we just said had the what? The highest protection, right? Had the most protection. The special warranty, does it have even higher protection? No, what's happening? What are we seeing? It's going backwards, it's going down. So our most strongest position or protection is the general warranty deed. 
the special warranty deed is going to have a lower standard. So Mr. Eugene, I wanna ask you then, what is the bargain and sale? That's gotta be the second highest, right? It's going even lower, okay? So a bargain and sale deed is that it contains no expressed warranties against encumbrances. And it implies, not expressively, it implies that the, the seller holds title and possession to the property. But we're not 100% certain on that. So a bargain and sale is basically, we, we think, we think this person has ownership. We think, okay? But, all right, we think they have ownership and we think they hold title and possession the, to the property, but we're not making any express warranties. We're not going over warranting anything, all right? We're not warranting anything. We are simply just going in and guesstimating. Now, what happens in this situation, a bargain and sale, sometimes is utilized in what's called a tax sale or a sheriff sale. And it's where the sheriff ends up in this particular situation they're selling the property and they're selling the property in this situation because a person did not end up paying their taxes, did not pay whatever. So the sheriff is saying, we think that we have a pretty strong guess that Mr. Eugene owned this property because he was paying taxes on it, but we're not gonna make any encumbrances or warranties because we're the sheriff's office and we're selling it. We're just doing it because the law requires us to do it. So you're accepting the property as is, okay? Now here's the best part about this one, is Mr. Eugene, if the sheriff sells his property, when they're not supposed to share the property, they're not supposed to sell it, okay? Then Mr. Eugene could come back and sue and end up possibly getting back his property, okay? So there is that opportunity or that potential that Mr. Eugene could try to come back and redeem it if it's wrongfully terminated. And I've had that happen before. I have had it where an individual ended up in the situation. They've gone in and they ended up, the individual has gone over, okay? And they have turned around and they ended up in this particular situation. Uh, they sold it at a tax sale the uh, sheriff wrote over the deed, transferred the deed, and because of a technicality, everything had to be reverted, and the owner got back all of their interest, okay? So when you're dealing with these, you have multiple different bargain and sales. You have different types of requirements when it comes to these different ownerships. Now, how many of y'all recall this one? This one up here at the top, Mr. Eugene, do you remember that one? Quick claim. Remember we talked about that? Mr. Wyatt was here and I said, well, Mr. Wyatt could just sign a quick claim deed and say he owns your property and sell it. Okay, this is that form here. Now, Mr. Mr. Eugene here, question for you. A quick claim deed provides the highest protection to buyer, right? Is that what that says up there? Least. You mean highest, right? What are you saying least for? That's highest, right? It's the least protection for the buyer. So in this situation, you do not in any shape or form, if you're a buyer, you want to click thing deed. It's basically, to be real honest with you, a piece of paper with your signature on it probably has more weight than a quick claim deed. Okay. A quick claim deed like it says, it's the least protection to a buyer. It offers no express or implied covenant or warranties. And it's used primarily simply to convey less than be simple or to cure a title defect. So let's play out that situation we just talked about. Mr. Eugene has gone over here in this particular situation. He sells his property to Mr. Jacob and Mr. Eugene's gone over and he sold his property to Mr. Jacob. But here's the thing that nobody knew. 
when Mr. Eugene sold his property, he was married, but he never disclosed that he was married to Miss Linda. And Mr. Eugene sold the property to, to Mr. Jacob, but only Mr. Eugene's signature was on it, not Miss Linda's. And Miss Linda had a 50% interest in the property because we're in a community property state. So Miss Linda comes and finds out that Mr. Eugene went and sold their property. So she comes in and she hires Mr. Garrett to sue and Miss Linda wins her case and she's entitled to 50% of the assets, the proceeds from the sale because it was her interest, okay? She owned half the property. So in that situation, Mr. Eugene has to pay Miss Linda 50%. But here's the thing. Do you think, Miss Linda, that Mr. Jacob wants to have to go and give you the property back and then rebuy it all over again? Yeah. No, Mr. Jacob wants to do what? He just wants to be done with it. He just wants to wipe his hand and keep his property. You don't want to deal with y'all. That's y'all's personal problem, not his. Okay. So Mr. Jacob, he wants to be left alone. So the easiest and most simplest way for the whole thing to be resolved is Mr. Jacob would have you complete a quick claim deed. And what you've just done is, remember like we talked the other day, it's any interest that I have in the property will convey. So since the sale's already done, we don't need to redo it. We just need you to transfer or cure a title defect where you can just transfer your interest over to Mr. Jacob and Mr. Jacob can be done with this whole thing, okay? So we're not going to issue a full general warranty deed. We may just use a quick claim deed, okay? Now, those are your four types of title or deed, I mean. Those are the four different methods. Now understand when we're talking about these situations, the four different methods here ultimately ends up, I wanna make certain that everybody's good here, our most highest, and I'm gonna question real quick, Mr. Garrett real quick, our most highest type of deed is what? What's our most highest type of deed, Mr. Garrett? Uh, do you mean like the one with most, most protection? protection. Uh, I'm trying to think what the name was, but it was the first one that you said. The general the warranty most... deed. Yeah. The general warranty is the most strongest. Mr. Keith, which is the least protection for the buyer? Quick claim. Quick claim. Perfect. Mr. Eugene here. Which one of these deeds is used often in a share or tax sale? A bargain and sale deed, okay? So when we deal with these, understand that when we're going through them, you need to be able to differentiate between them because they will ask you those questions. This is one of them that they'll pick off 10 questions just from that little section, that quick. Okay, so you need to be able to differentiate between those. Now, another thing, I know that everybody, especially Mr. Jacob, Miss, Miss Linda, and Mr. Eugene, y'all love this one, this word, this three letter word here, right? Correct, Miss Linda? Yeah. You love taxes, right? Yeah. No, why you say no? Well, they, they keep going up. So guess what? <laughs> when you sell property, you get to pay taxes on it. Isn't that so wonderful? And you also get pay taxes on just transferring, conveying the property from one person to another. So in that situation, we have what's called transfer tax stamps. And they are paid upon the conveyance of real estate. So when the deed is actually recorded, you get to pay tax. It's paid according to the agreement in the contract. So it's either by the buyer, the seller, or both, okay? So it's up to the parties to determine who pays what and how much do each of them pay, okay? And the key thing while I'm talking about that, 99.9999% of the time, everything in a real estate contract is negotiable. Your test will a lot of times say, and Mr. Grossman can tell you, a lot of times your test will say, 
the seller must pay closing costs. The buyer must pay the ta transfer tax stamps. Mr. Grossman, is that true? No, it's what? It is all subjective to the parties. That's why 99.99% of the time, the contract is open to any kind of agreement. That's what the parties come to, okay? So in these particular situations, these are options, okay? These are simple options. Now we're going into the good stuff. Now we're getting into the good stuff. So what we just all talked about just earlier, we were talking about voluntary. So all these things are voluntarily done. Mr. Eugene voluntarily sells his house. Ms. Linda sells her house. Those are things that are voluntarily done. My question now here, Ms. Linda, what does this bullet say here? What's this say here? So it means that it's that it's just it. We, we do what you say, right? That's what that's saying. We, the word "without owner's consent" without means that the owner agrees to it, right? No. Why do you say no? It, what does that mean? We sell your property by what? By force. Okay. We sell your property by force. We force the sale of your property. That's why it's called involuntary alienation. We are taking your property without your consent. Okay. So the very most important one is the transfer by what we call adverse possession. Very important here. It's where one may make a claim and take property away from another if the claimant's use of the property is boom, 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 boom. Multiple ways. Very first one, open. Meaning if I was to just look at it, I would assume that in this particular situation that say Mr. Garrett, he's living in the property. I would assume he's always there. It's obvious to anyone that looks that he owns the property. Notorious, other people know about it. Continuous, meaning it's uninterrupted the period of time that's according to law. Hostile, it's without the owner's consent and adverse, it's the true owner's possession, okay? So what happens is, let me explain this in this situation. This still occurs today, by the way, okay? This still occurs today, especially in very rural areas, okay? Say in this hypothetical that uh, Mr. Keith, he owns, or his family owns 500 acres of land, okay? Mr. Keith has 500 acres of land. Mr. Keith, uh, he's, you know, he tries to take care of his land, watches it, but primarily he lives at the very front of his 500 acres. Now, Miss Linda, I know you're from the farm, from country land and all. Miss Linda, I'm gonna ask you a question. It's 500 acres, that's like, Real small, right? You can walk around it in like maybe 10 seconds, right? Now, how, well, how, how long does it take to walk 500 acres? Quite some, time. Quite some time. And can you be consistently watching 500 acres if you're one person? No, it's very difficult, isn't it? It's very hard. There are people that own thousands of acres, okay? So Mr. Keith, he's an older gentleman and he ends up, he primarily just lives at the front of his property and he just he just stays there. He just mows around in his, you know, he has about a half an acre he takes care of and mows and all. The rest of it's just wooded. And he'll randomly from time to time walk around the property, okay? Well, Mr. Keith, guess what? There's this guy named Mr. Eugene and he ended up bought, bought some land behind you and Mr. Eugene has gone over here and his property butts up against yours. And Mr. Eugene is like, man, I really just need like an extra 10 acres and that would really make my property look good. And there's no fence or anything here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just fence 10 acres of Mr. Keith with my 10 acres and I'll have 20 acres, it'll just look good. And he's at the very back part of Mr. Keith's 
500 acres. So Mr. Eugene goes over and it's open because of the fact is any person that's driving down can see that Mr. Eugene has done what? He's put a fence up. It's notorious because Mr. Eugene tells everybody around that, well, yeah, he's got 500 acres. He don't need all that acreage. I'm, I'll take 10 acres of it. I'm going to maintain it anyway. It makes it look better. So other people know it's notorious. And it's uninterrupted because Mr. Eugene's at the very back of his 500 acres and Mr. T has never ended up went back there. He actually has to go past two rivers to get to that 500 acres. So what ends up happening is it's continuous, it's not uninterrupted. It's hostile because the true owner never gave consent to give that 10 acres to Mr. Eugene. And it's adverse because the true owner's possession is being taken away. So what happens is, is Mr. Eugene fences it, he maintains it, he even pays, the key thing in Texas is he pays the taxes for that 10 acres. And he does it for 10 years. After 10 years, guess what ends up happening? What do y'all think happens? Mr. Eugene does what? Mr. Eugene ends up, he goes over in the situation and Mr. Eugene's gonna follow what? A claim for what? For ownership. I ended up, I went over and I turned around and I've been taking care of it. It's been open, notorious, continuous, hostile and adverse, but nobody's ever stopped me. Mr. Keith never came back and stopped me. So since he's never stopped me and I maintained it, I file a claim. Now, Mr. Keith, how do you feel about that? Because guess what? Mr. Keith's going to get served with paperwork saying that you want to take Mr. Keith's property. Now, Mr. Keith, how do you feel about that? Not very good about that. Not at all. He's, he's a backstabber, ain't he, Mr. Keith? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> right? So in that situation is he's gone over here. And he ended up, he took your property. Man, you're you're mean, Mr. Eugene, you're mean here. Poor guy went over here, he, he, this is his family's land and you're just taking it from him. Yeah, he wasn't using it. But the thing is, is guess what? It's just like in anything else, this is the only wrong part here, is under what we call squatters rights, this is what this is, it's adverse possession. In Texas, we call it squatters. You're squatting on Mr. Keith's property. You're using his property without consent. The only thing is, is this is what's crooked, is if you go over to Mr. Keith's house and broke in and stole his car, you'd go to jail, okay? But if you go squat on his property and you sit there for 10 years, the court say, Okay, here you go, Mr. Eugene. You can have ownership to, to that 10 acres. Would he, get a clear deed? he would get a clear title to it because he would follow it and show that there was no stopping. So in this situation, you go steal something and they send you to jail. But you go steal somebody's property and they give it to you. What sense does that make? None at all, right? So in this particular situation is what Mr. Keith has a duty to do and it's his responsibility, and that's why they give Mr. Keith 10 years. Mr. Keith, within 10 years, should have done what? He should have been able to see it in 10 years. It's not like it's a year, it's not like it's two. We're giving you 10 years. There is a, a statute for five years, but it's a lot more stricter. So there is a statute, normally not many people get five years. It's normally 10 years minimal, okay? Now, it's a little different in this aspect, and I've had this when I worked at the law firm. It's a little different in this situation. Say, Mr. Eugene, that Mr. Keith and you had talked, and you're like, man, Mr. Keith, it'd be nice if I could go over and have you know, access to this 10 acres because it's right by the river and I need some water for my cattle, and uh, you know, I'd really like to do that. And Mr. Keith says, you know what, Mr. Eugene, just, just go on and put a fence up there, you know, it's mine, but you just help yourself. You know, I don't mind you using it. Okay. 
You're just using it is all. Not yours. He's giving you right. Mr. Eugene cannot file a claim on that. He cannot come back to that because the fact is, is he granted you what's called a license. You have a right, a right to use it. He's letting you use it, but you can't come back because the fact is, is it is not hostile and it's not adverse. You're not trying to steal his interest. You're simply going over there and you are ending up, you have turned around and you are, you have an open, notorious and continuous time but you're not being hostile because Mr. Keith agreed that you could have to, that you could use it. Miss Linda. Okay. It was a verbal agreement. Right. Okay. It's verbal. That's okay. correct. So if it was a verbal agreement, then how would that hold up? Because the And that's, so let me explain for everybody online that's listening. What she said is she said, wait a minute, that was a verbal agreement. Mr. Keith verbally said that Mr. Eugene could access the property and all. That is true. But here's the thing is if Mr. Eugene goes over and falls and says it was an adverse hostile deal, it's on Mr. Keith to prove that there's a verbal agreement. That's why we always tell people when you do stuff like that, you always want to get it in what? In writing. If Mr. Keith failed to get in writing, that's not Mr. Eugene's problem. That's Mr. Keith's problem. But all you have to do in that situation is this. Is Mr. Keith just has to get people around that he said he's told people. Because, I mean, you think about it. Common sense. If you tell Mr. Eugene he could use the property, Mr. Eugene's going to tell other people around town, oh, Mr. Keith was real nice. He let me use the property. I fenced it off, blah, 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 blah. All Mr. Keith has to do is go round up those people that Mr. Eugene said that, and that's all you have to do to establish because they're not selling the property, so the statute of frauds don't apply. He's just using the property. Does that make sense? Okay. Statute of frauds only applies when there is a sale of real estate. Now, if Mr. Eugene was leasing the property, a ground lease, then it needs to be in writing if it's more than one year. Okay, make sense? All right. By the way, uh, Mr. Eugene, Mr. Keith says you owe him $100 million. He's waiting on the check. So, oh, checks in the mail. Sound, sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, in this situation, another one is another way that we end up doing it. So the first one was adverse. So we're, we're adversely taking another person. In this method, we're transferring title by will. Okay. And so it cannot be superseded when we're dealing with these. If you notice here, real quick, I'm going to go back just so you can see the difference here. If you look up here at the top, this is the only adverse possession that's done by squatting. Now, there are other methods we'll talk about, and one of them is taxes. You fail to pay your taxes, what happens? We talked about this already. They sell at a tax sale. You fail to pay your mortgage, they sell it. Those are classified as involuntary alienation. We're just, tonight, we're just talking about the adverse possession of somebody just coming on and taking your stuff. Okay, so know the difference. They're still adverse, but they're not going into detail because we talked about that already. But you need to be aware of them. Now, conveyance of a descendant's property. Now, when an individual dies, we end up, we can transfer title by will. Now, Miss Linda, real quick, what is a will? A will is the estate you leave behind. That's the estate, but what's a will? The estate you leave behind is your estate. What's a will? Who you want it to go to? It's the document that says this is where it's distributing your assets. It is the document that says. This is where I want my assets to go to. This is who I want them to go to. The will states where things are supposed to go to. Now, it cannot supersede the state laws of what's called dower and curtsy. Okay? Dower and curtsy is basically husband and wife. The husband has interest in the wife's property, and the wife has interest in the husband's property, period. Okay? Now, one of the key things in this situation is if you live in a state where, for example, that when a husband dies, 
his property automatically goes to the wife, he cannot end up creating a will that's going to supersede that, period, and vice versa for the wife, okay? But in a community property state here in Texas, Mr. Eugene owns 50% of the estate and Ms. Linda owns 50% of their estate, husband and wife, okay? But Mr. Eugene, you can give away your 50% interest to your kids. Ms. Linda's 50%, however, you can't get rid of it, okay? It's hers. So in that situation, when you pass away, you can grant your 50% interest to your children. But Miss Linda, her 50% is still her interest. You can't get rid of her interest just because of that situation. You have to in these situations, you gotta be able to differentiate between the two. That makes sense. So you can only get rid of your portion and nobody else's, okay? Now, the legal requirements for making a will. Number one, it has to be according to the state laws, like we talked about earlier. You cannot go over here, <clears throat> excuse me, and right underneath this podium, this goes to Linda Nobles. This table goes to Garrett. This chair goes to Mr. Jacob, okay? You can't just go around and write stuff on furniture, okay? You have to end up, they have to follow the laws of the state. There has to be a will that states that it is your last will and testament and you are of conscious and competent mind, okay? You have to be competent. Then you can disperse it. So Mr. Eugene, if you wanted to give these items that I just talked about to those individuals, you can do it, but you need to put it in a will. You don't just go around your house and willy nilly writing stuff, okay? You don't do that. You have to end up you have to follow the laws of the land. Another one we have to make certain of is you have to be legally competent. Mr. Eugene, if you're 16 years of age, can you make a will? Oh, sure can, but it's, still it, it's not legally competent because you're not of the age of the majority. Right. You can write one, but good luck. It's not going to be utilized because you're not legally competent. You don't know what you're doing. These wheels also must be written and signed, sometimes signed before witnesses. In Texas, you have to have two witnesses. These witnesses do not have to be friends, family, any of that. These have to be two neutral parties that have no interest in the will, period. Because what their job is, is they're stating, if Mr. Eugene and Ms. Linda, you're drafting a will, and Mr. Grossman and Mr. Colton ends up, they're the witnesses here in this particular situation. They have no interest in the will because the fact is they are just making certain, they're saying, yeah, when they signed the will, they were, they were sound mind. They knew what they were talking about. So in that situation, witnesses help enforce the legitimacy of a will, okay? Now, there is, however, if you don't have this, a will, there is transfer by title by descendant. So if you end up dying with no will, you pass away with no will, then we go into a situation what's called the laws of descendancy. And what happens is, is they of course vary state by state, but oftentimes what it is, is it's the heirs that will inherit. So the importance of the reason I tell people this all the time is why it is important to end up getting a will is because of the fact is every person in their family has one person in their family that they don't want to inherit their stuff. Every person in every family, I'm seeing head shake all through here tonight. Every person in every family has one person they don't want their assets to go to. Okay, is that right, Mr. Grossman? Uh-huh. So in that situation is, what happens is, is if you don't have a will, you're taking a shot of your property might going to that person you don't want it to go to. So for example, say that Mr. Grossman in this situation does not want Mr. Colton to end up getting his, his uh, part of his estate. 
But Mr. Colton is Mr. Grossman's only brother. Okay. Mr. Grossman has no children. Mr. Grossman has worked his entire life and he has a million and a half dollars sitting in the bank and he has multiple properties and a successful business. All right. So Mr. Grossman's doing pretty good here. But his brother, Mr. Colton here, he's a bum. He, he ends up, he, uh, he sleeps around on everybody's, uh, everybody's couches and just kind of goes partying all the time and all this. I'm just picking on you, Mr. Colton, tonight, okay? But ends up, Mr. Colton, he ends up, he's just jumping around, partying, okay? Mr. Grossman's like, man, I don't want my assets to go to him. He'll just drink them away. I'm partying away. But Mr. Grossman, guess what? Mr. Grossman doesn't go over there and he doesn't get a wheel. He's too busy. That's what I always hear, too busy. Mr. Grossman is driving home one night. Somebody hits him and kills him. He has no parents. He has no, no children. His only living heir is who? Mr. Colton. His brother. Because there is no wheel on how to distribute the assets, all of Mr. Grossman's estate transfers to Mr. Colton. And he gets every penny. Mr. Colton said he's partying it up. He's ready. He's, he's ready. <laughs> no, he's forgot. He's done. Real estate's done. He's going. But no, in that situation, that's your heirs. That's where the heirs inherit. Of course, that's a, a crazy hypothetical, but I use that simply because the fact is, if guys and gals, it happens. It happens in more than what you know. Your will, no matter who it is, Colton may end up, you may have in, inherited all that cash. You're now the only living relative of your parents, okay? So your brother died, you're the only one, but you may hate your aunt. Okay, and you only have one aunt. Well, guess what? He would want to immediately get a will to give it to whoever you want because otherwise, if something happens to you, what happens now? That's going to go to that crazy aunt you didn't like. Okay, so it comes into that situation of you want to have a will to end up protecting yourself so that you don't lose your assets when we come down to it. It's very important in that situation. Now, how do we transfer? How do we go in here and, and move things around? How do we transfer stuff? Well, once an individual dies, let's continue playing out that hypothetical with Mr. Grossman dies in an accident. Now, once Mr. Grossman dies, Mr. Colton, real quick question. Do you automatically, the minute he dies, get all of his stuff that very second? No, it takes time, right? It's gotta go through probate, okay? So a probate, the very first thing that they have to do is they got to see when a person dies, we got to see, did Mr. Grossman have a deed, I mean, a will, or did he not? That's the first question the probate court asks. If he did not have a will, then, so let, let me put it this way. If you want to take notes, here we go. If he had a will, he died what's called testate. So if he dies with a will, he died testate. If Mr. Grossman died without a will, he died in testate, okay? So if he dies with a will, he died testate, and the, the court will end up proving up or confirming the validity of that will, determining the precise assets of the deceased person, and identify to where those need to be basically passed along to. So if you have a will, you die testate, you're going to follow that process right there. Okay, if you died in testate, Mr. Grossman didn't have a will, he dies in testate, then the court does not have a will. So the court is going to have to end up bringing in what's called an administrator. And an administrator is going to be somebody that the court brings in, could randomly be Mr. Eugene here, you don't even know who he is. Court comes in, says, well, Mr. Eugene, another guy just died. 
once you go find out who his heirs are, call around and I'll see what you find out. You go find out that Colton is his only brother. There's no other family. So you would report back to the judge and the judge would say, well, Mr. Eugene, what did you find out? Well, Mr. Colton is the, the rightful heir to the property and he's the only living heir. And I would say, Mr. Colton, are you related to Mr. Grossman? Yes, I was. Are you his only brother? Yes, I was. All right. Well, then we're proving up that you are his only heir. So in this situation, Mr. Eugene, I want you to go identify any of his assets, Mr. Grossman's assets, report back to me how much assets there are, what all he had. And then I want you to turn around and we're going to go through here and we're going to, we're going to transfer it to Mr. Colton. Okay. And so that's where they go through. They, so they still do two and three. You just don't have a will in an intestate. Okay. In a will, this is something you might want to write down because they'll test you on this. There is an executor. So it's E X. Let me see, E-X-E-C-U-T-O-R. And then I want you to put a flash and put R-I-X. So if it's Tor, T-O-R, it's a male. If it's a woman, it's what? What is it? Trick. Trick. Yes. If it is a male... It's tour, executor. If it's a woman, it's executrix. Okay? So when they write a question on your exam, and this is how they're going to get you, this is how they're going to get you. When they write a question on the exam, they will say, Mr. Grossman died and an executrix was established for his estate. How did Mr. Grossman die? Testate, intestate. Or, or blah, 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 I'll give you two other things. The answer would be what? He died testate because there's an executrix. If you die without a will, the person is called an administrator. Or Miss Linda, what's the female word for that? Well, no, say it. Administratrix. Okay. So if we're talking about administrating, we're talking about an intestate will. We talk about executor. We're talking about a testate will. Okay, that's how they'll catch you on the exam. See, a lot of this stuff I'm teaching you, you'll see when we have our prep course. The prep course goes through a lot more detail. This hits mainly at the big points, but these are things you need to know. This is how they catch you. Now, they also will distribute only those assets to, that do not distribute themselves. Let me tell you something, this is a sidebar, okay? If you wanna save your spouse or your children a lot of money, please do some estate planning. Please do some estate planning. And the reason that I say that, and the reason that I say bring in an estate planning is because of this situation. If you leave a very large estate, I used to work for a probate lawyer, they love to take a nice big chunk of that and put it in their back pocket. And guess who also loves to take a nice big chunk of it? That T or that three letter word that Miss Linda and Mr. Eugene love. IRS. They love to take their chunk of it too. If you want your children to get their assets, you want to have assets that distribute themselves. For example, if there's a life insurance policy, you can designate a beneficiary. So Mr. Colton may end up, he is the father of Mr. Grossman. And in this situation, Mr. Grossman, or Mr. Colton goes over and he has a life insurance policy on behalf of his son, Mr. Grossman, for a million dollars. Now, if he did not establish a beneficiary, then it's gotta go to, through probate. And if it goes through probate, what happens? The taxes are gonna take probably half of it and the attorney. So in that situation is Mr. Grossman or Mr. Colton to make certain that his son gets the entire amount would establish a beneficiary. So if Mr. Colton passes away, the entire $1 million would transfer to Mr. Grossman with no need of probate. Do you, have to pay taxes on? you do not have to pay taxes on certain life insurance policies. No, ma'am. Okay. 
It depends on how it's structured. Okay, and that, we're not insurance class, so we'll I could have a whole conversation on that too, but we'll just keep it to that point. Another thing is, you have a checking account, okay? Especially Mr. Eugene, Miss Linda, Mr. Jacob, Miss Jacob as well. Uh, in this situation, if you're married, you want to make certain that if you have a joint account, that your spouse has what's called or that account has right of survivorship. Now, I will say banks, if you go down to a bank and you say, I want to designate or have right of survivorship on my account, the teller's going to look at you like deer in the headlights. They're going to say, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. What you need to ask them is you want to establish a beneficiary on your account. And you want to create it where when you end up, if something were to happen to you, you don't want your funds in that account frozen. So what happens, and a lot of people don't do this, is they end up, they have a joint account, but what they don't understand is with a joint account is if you end up, one of the parties dies, the account freezes until it's released by probate, unless there has a beneficiary or a, a right of survivorship included on that account. So what will happen, and I've had clients that have gone through that, husband or wife passes away, they have all their life savings is in their checking account, and they can't access it to hire an attorney because the spouse has passed, the bank has put a hold on it. And what y'all don't know is the banks actually have a division within them, especially large banks, have a division that they check the obituary every single day. So they go through the obituaries page, and if they see a spouse dead, they freeze that account and they will not release any funds in that account. So it is imperative that you designate and set up your assets in a way that they will distribute themselves without a hold being present. Extremely, extremely important, okay? Because you don't wanna be in that situation. So again, if they distribute themselves, they don't need to probate to distribute the real estate that's held in joint tenancy. So for example, if say for example in this hypothetical, uh, Mr. Eugene, Miss Linda, they go into this particular situation and God forbid Miss Linda passes away. What happens is, is because it's community property is held in joint tenancy, Mr. Eugene does not have to go to court to get Miss Linda's 50%. Because the fact is, what did we just talk about? Dower and curtsy, it reverts back to the spouse, unless the will states otherwise on her 50%, okay? So again, we have to make certain when we're going through these situations that we make certain that we clarify these terms. Now, when dealing with public recordings, we wanna make certain that the recording in the act of placing the document in public records, we want to make certain that as we do this, that we are publicly putting it out there that these individuals own the property, okay? So when we have a deed, we publicly are going to record it in the county clerk's office. Now, when you go, there's two notices here, and you need to know these differences. It's very important when we talk about constructive notice and actual notice, okay? Constructive notice is kind of like this. My sister is a teacher, okay? So a constructive notice in this situation could be this. How many of you, probably Colton, you might've had this happen when you were in school. How many of you had teachers that had like a little pin up board and they would sometimes pin up important things on the board like assignments or stuff. And they put it up there and they tell you, important information's up here. You, you need to look at this, you should check this every day, okay? So a pin up board, is considered constructive notice. You state it in this particular situation, the same as uh, my, my sister, she ended up, she was the one that was your teacher, Colton, for example, and she puts a, a pin up board here and she says, whenever there's important information on her first day of class, she walks in, any import, important information relating to how we run or anything in my class, I'm gonna put it right here on this board, okay? 
I'm not going to text you. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to email you. I'm going to put it right here on this board. Okay? It's your duty as students to come check this. That's our first thing. So when she ends up, there are grades. She grades everybody's quizzes, her, the test. She puts your student number and she puts grades. She just pins them up, all the grades, and she goes, sits back down. Okay? Now, if you want to know your grade, how do you find out, Colton, your grade? What do you have to do? That's right. You actually have to come into that room, go look at it to find out your grade. That's called constructive notice. Okay? What do you think actual notice is, Colton? There you go. Actual notice is where my sister comes over, you took her test, and she goes over and she says, okay, Mr. Colton, you made an A on the test. Congratulations. That's actual notice. So constructive notice is the legal presumption that information may be obtained about a partial real estate by an individual through due diligence. They're doing their own searches. Okay, so you coming and looking, that's your due diligence. Well, actual notice is the information about a partial real estate is available and someone has been given the information and actually knows it. Those are your differences. So let me put this in real estate terms. If you wanna know what sales are coming up on the real estate for Brazos County, you go down to your local courthouse and when you go into a courthouse, they have a pinup board, a big old pinup board and they pin up sales that are coming up, tax sales or whatever. Everyone in the county can go to the courthouse and look at that pinup board. Everyone's welcome to do that. But do you think the county is gonna come out to say 600,000 people and send all of y'all an email about a tax sale? No, it costs a lot of money to do that, right? Think about every tax that we had to mail out that stuff. That costs a lot of money. So constructive notice is it's your duty to go find it. We don't come to you, you come to us. So I tell you in real estate, when you're in school, when you're in class, the professor, I give you stuff. I give it to you, I'm sharing my information with you. You become a real estate agent, Mr. Grossman, you become a real estate agent. Does that continue? Does the, once you get your license, does clients just, oh my God, I need to line up to you, Mr. Grossman, so you can help me buy a house? No, you have to do what, Mr. Grossman? You got to go out there and find them, right? You got to go out there and do the work, okay? So when we're dealing with this, that's your difference between your constructive and your actual. Now, I'm not going to even talk about this top one. We beat that to death yesterday, didn't we? We beat that to death. I'm not even going to spend any moments on that. <clears throat> but I am going to spend a few minutes on number two. Because of the fact is, not all liens are actually gonna be recorded. Not all debts are actually recorded. Miss Linda went over to say Mr. Garrett's house and she did some interior decorating to get it ready for sale. And Miss Linda spent, and I found out this amount by the way yesterday in a meeting, Interior decorators start off minimum with a $5,000 retainer. $5,000 retainer. Okay. So Miss Linda goes in. She does her initial staging and her concepts and does all her stuff. But it's all said and done. Miss Garrett, she's charged you $10,000. $10,000 for Miss Garrett for interior decorating. Mr. Garrett goes over. He don't pay you, Miss Linda. He don't pay you, Mr. Garrett. He's a cheapskate. He said, huh, he don't like your work. He said, you did horrible, right, Mr. Garrett? Mr. Garrett said, you did horrible. So go over here in this situation. He said, I ain't paying for it. Well, Miss Linda goes over and Mr. Uh, Miss Linda goes over and she ends up, she puts mechanic lien against him and wins. She gets a $10,000 loan or uh, judgment against it. But Miss Linda <clears throat> does not record the document. She doesn't record it. Miss Linda, are you obligated to record your lien on Mr. Garrett's property? No, you're not. You're not obligated to even your mortgage company 
isn't obligated to record their documents. It's optional. They do it because they want to be, as we said earlier, priority, but ultimately it's not required. That's why, as we were talking earlier about warranties and protections, imagine in this situation if Mr. Garrett sells that property off to Mr. Grossman. Mr. Grossman gets the property, and sure freaking enough, after he gets the property, guess what Miss Linda does? She calls it against that property. Now, Mr. Grossman, if you only ended up getting a bargain and sale deed, who gets to pay that debt? You do. He gets the debt, and Miss Linda ends up gets to take it. Miss Garrett gets to walk away scotch free. So the problem here in this situation is that's why title searches are not perfect. They can only find debts that they know about that's recorded. If they're not recorded, it doesn't mean that they don't exist, okay? Now, another one is what we call the chain of title. And this is what the search, the title search is for. The chain of title is gonna be a record in regards to the property's ownership. How many of you ever know what a linked chain is? What does that look like, Mr. Colton? What's a linked chain look like? Uh huh. What do they look like? One link does what? They do like this. And they keep going and going and going, right? Multiple ones. Right. That's what this is. So imagine, Mr. Colton, that you own the property. Here's the first link. You sell it off to Mr. Eugene. He's the next link. Mr. Eugene sells it off to Mr. Grossman. Now we have another one. Mr. Grossman sells it off to Miss Linda. Miss Linda, however, ends up, does not, she does something to call the breakage in the links. And she tries to sell it to me. Say her daughter, Ms., say Miss Linda passes away and her daughter without her other children sells it off to me. She has to have all of the children to agree to sell it, not just one. There's what's called a gap. Here's the last link that was from Stefan to Miss Linda. But now Miss Linda, Miss April, has now ended up sold it. We have a gap in title. Our chain has been broken. So a gap or cloud on the title exists. So the only way to fix it is all of the children that Miss Linda left has to sign a quick claim to fix, to repair that linkage. Does that make sense? Everybody get that, okay? To fix it, like we said, is a suit to quiet title. It is a court action that is intended to establish or settle the title to a particular property, especially when there is a cloud on title. So in that situation, Miss Linda passes, she has three children when she passes. Miss April, one of the three, ends up, she sells the property without the other two. There is really not a full transfer of ownership. Thus, there is a gap for us to fix it. The other two have to file and have to deal with a suit to quiet title. They have to do the quick claim. Once the other two sign, we've now remedied the problem, okay? Title search and abstract. Now I'm not gonna to spend too much on this because we already talked about it, but I will say this. If you're gonna be a real estate agent, you wanna be trained in this. I'm gonna tell you how many times that I've ended up where myself, I've looked at property and wanted to buy it. If you want a title search or an abstract done, it can cost a few thousand bucks. But if you want to end up learning how to do title searches and abstracting, it can cost a few hundred bucks. And once you get the skill down, you don't need anything else. I actually teach the classes on title search and abstract. I teach for my students, my people at a discount. For other people that are not with me, I charge them a, a normal rate. But title search and abstract, the title search is where they examine all the public records to determine any defects that exist on the chain of title. They look for those gaps. And the abstract of title is a summary report that's conducted by the title searcher. And that individual 
It's basically an abstractor. Now, hold on just a minute. Now in this situation here, okay, if you're doing title searches for another person, you have to be licensed. But if you're doing searches for yourself, you don't have to be licensed. But what happens is, and I can't tell you how many times that I've ended up, a client has came to me and they're like, well, I'm thinking about selling a property. And I'm like, man, I want to go buy that property. I don't want to list it. I want to buy it. But I also don't want to go spend two, $3,000 to have a title search done by a licensed person. I want to go do my own searches. Thankfully, I know how to do it. But a, a lot of realtors don't know how to do a title search. Okay, so it's imperative that you know these skills because it makes you marketable for yourself so that you can go do a, a title search and know that, okay, if I buy this property, there's nothing that's going to come back and haunt me. Ms. Linda, you had a question. When you do a title search, do you just do it instead of uh, Texas? Or you only do. You you only, if you're doing a title search, it's only, remember, like we talked before, all deed records are filed where? Where the county where the property is located. So you only do your title search in that county. Nowhere else, just in that county. Now, again, coming back to this, like I want to add to it, sidebar for a minute. Mr. Eugene, he goes through the class with me. I teach him how to do it and all this stuff. And Mr. Eugene goes out and he does a title search. And he's like, all right, this looks perfect. It's all good and clear. And he buys property. Two, three months later, he gets hit with a mechanics lien. He comes in, wait, wait a minute, Mr. U or Justin, you, you went over and you told me, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to say, was it recorded or unrecorded? Well, it was unrecorded. Well, it doesn't matter if you ended up, if you would have hired somebody or you did it yourself, you still would have been in the same boat because it wasn't recorded. So sometimes you have to take a risk. You got to take a gamble. Okay. Marketable title. When dealing with marketable title, the seller is required to deliver the buyer or to the buyer at closing. It has to be a full title that's marketable. To be marketable, and you've got to know these three things, extremely important. To be marketable, a title must disclose no serious defects and not depend on doubtful questions of law or fact to prove its valid, number one. Number two, not expose the buyer to the hazard of litigation or threaten to quiet enjoyment of the property. Number three, convince a reasonable, well-informed and prudent buyer acting on business principles and with knowledge of the facts of the, and their legal significance that the purchaser could sell or mortgage the property at a later time. These are your three elements for a marketable title. And you have to have them and you have to know them. Further, the title that is not marketable can still be transferred, but it may be limited or restricted. Okay, so the buyer cannot be forced to accept this type. This is that type of situation often referred to as a salvage title on a car. You can end up buying a salvage car, but you're probably not going to get insurance on it, and you're probably not going to be able to get some other stuff. So a marketable title that is unmarketable can still be sold. It's just going to be limited and possibly restricted. However, there can be opportunities that might cure the defect. Now, we talked about this plenty today, especially at the very beginning. We talked about it in a couple of other classes. To show proof of ownership, the proof of ownership may be established by a certificate of title, but it will not reveal, what did we say here? Unrecorded liens or rights of parties in possession. For example, if Mr. Eugene is selling his property to Mr. Jacob, and Mr. Eugene is leasing the property. If I do a title search, am I going to find that lease? No, I'm not. So I'm not going to know who has rights to the possession of that property unless Mr. Eugene discloses them to me. So it is imperative in this particular situation that Mr. Eugene ends up, he's disclosing and being honest. Now I'm going to test you, Miss Linda, real quick. <clears throat> Proof of ownership. Is there a document in real estate that is called certificate of title? Yes. 
Mr. Eugene, you're shaking your head. No, what's that mean? No. No, what's it called? Starts with a D and ends with a what? The deed. A deed is the certificate of title. It's the proof of ownership. There is no such thing as a certificate of title. You get a certificate of title on what, Mr. Eugene? On a vehicle. You do not get a certificate of title on real estate. Okay. You get a deed. Okay. Very important on that. Public records. Where do you often go look to find public record information, Mr. Grossman? Google. Google, but where's the physical place that you'd go to? To the county courthouse. The county, courthouse. The county courthouse is your public records. Now, title insurance is gonna be issued as an owner's policy or a mortgagee's lender policy under which the insured is gonna be protected from losses arising from any defects in title, it also ensures against hidden defects and identifies any exclusions that include readily apparent title defects and zoning and others that could possibly be present. It is important and imperative by all shapes and sizes that when we are dealing with this, we want to make certain that there is a breakdown in regards to the full disclosure of the property. If at any time a party, a seller, tries to hide something and the buyer can prove that the seller was hiding it, guess what? You can be sued and if it was deceptive, it can be three times the actual damages that you actually caused. Now my question, a lot of agents ask me this all the time. Mr. Eugene, you asked me, you say, Mr. Nobles, I, uh, I went and visited with my first client, Mr. Colton today, and Mr. Colton is selling his property. And I asked him to fill out a seller's disclosure and also tell me of any liens or encumbrances, and he refuses to do it. How do I get Mr. Colton to tell me everything that's wrong with the property? What do you do, Mr. Eugene, in that situation? What do you do if you sit down and your client refuses to complete a seller's disclosure or refuses to provide any information at all? What do you do? No, you never do it. Remember, you never do it. How do you get him to get you the information? That's one thing, by the way, I'm glad you said that. It is not your duty as a realtor to go find information. It's fine if you go find it, but it ultimately, Mr. Colton has to agree that you disclose it. So you can find stuff and give it to him, but it's Mr. Colton who has to agree for you to release that. It's not your choice. So how do you get Mr. Colton to be honest and share information with you? Ms. Linda, how would you get Mr. Colton to uh, disclose and fill out information and be honest with you? How would you get him to do it? So she says she would sit down and tell Mr. Fulton that he needs to fill out this disclosure. Or he needs to find another agent if he's, if he's not willing to be work with you. Mr. Grossman, do you agree or disagree with that? His, but would you agree with what she said, though? Um, no. No, no, no. Here's the thing. You never... You, I mean, I'm being honest. you never, I know you're being honest, but you never want to get rid of your client. You want to know how you scare Mr. Uh, Mr. Colton and sharing some stuff with you? No, you don't do that. <laughs> you walk back here and you say, you sit down here and you say, Mr. Colton, how much money you like losing? Because you're about to lose a crap ton because you're going to get sued. You want to you wanna fill these forms out or you want to get sued? What you want to do, man? When you bring up suing, what happens, Colton? They don't want to get sued. You want to really get to a client that won't share information with you? Bring up, you want to get sued? 
You want to get sued three times? Then don't work with me. You want to you want to sell your house and you want to do it right? Then work with me. But if you ain't going to work with me, I'll put it on the market. I'll do all that. But when that lawsuit comes, don't look for me to come protect you because I'm going to say you didn't work with me at all. It's up to you. Am I being rude in that situation at all, Colton? I'm being what? I'm being assertive. Do you see what I'm saying? The key thing with clients is you will have clients that will be very strict, if you see what I'm saying. It will be very much like, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. You have to lay the groundwork down. It's your job as a realtor to tell them, do you want to get sued? I'll protect you. That's my key thing on any of my clients. I always tell them, I will protect you all day long. I will be there. I will be by your side and I will fight for you to the day that's done. I promise you. But you better be on the same page with me. And if we can't be on the same page, then I, I ain't the right person for you. Now, would you rather have an agent like that, Colton, or would you rather have an agent that's just like, yeah, I just want you to just, I'm going to find another agent. Which one do you want? You want that first one, right? Because you know if something goes wrong, who's got your back? That person, right? Okay. So the key thing in these situations is, is you have to get your clients to end up being where they're going to work with you. And sometimes you've got to lay your foot down, put your, lay down the law and put your foot down and say, you know what? No, I am not going to be pushed around. You are the expert. Yes, Ms. Linda, there are certain times that, yes, you will want to let them go. I've done that. I've, I've let million-dollar clients go. Didn't want to deal with them. They wouldn't work with me. I don't need you. You're, I don't care about money. That's one thing everybody will hear from me. I don't care about money. I'll make more money. Money's not a problem. I would rather not make that sale and not have to deal with a year's worth of headache and do multiple other small transactions than deal with one person that's going to be a hell client that's going to last me for an entire 12 months when I can go do something else and it not be as bad. Well, I feel like if you're not going to work for me at the very beginning, then, and you try and try and try and try, and try if you're consistently trying, yes, Miss Linda, if you're consistently trying and, and you were trying with Mr. Colton and you keep trying and trying and trying and Mr. Colton won't work with you, then yes, you need to let him go. But you also need to have that, what I call a come to Jesus talk with him before you let him go. And what's a come to Jesus talk, Mr. Eugene? What's a come to Jesus talk? Some people may not know what that is. You know what that is? What do, what do a lot of people... When they end up, when they want you to come to come to Jesus, they come in and they use a lot of pressure on you, don't they? Scare you out, scare you to, to what? Uh huh. The same concept is you have to walk in and you got to say, "Hey, Mr. Eugene, you're not working with me, okay? I'm here to end up. I'm I'm your partner in this. Now." Do you want me to work with you or do you want me to work against you? Because if you want me to work against you, then I might as well just walk out of here and be done. But if you want me to end up continuing to do what I do, then you got to, yes, you got to work with me. I had a client today. I'll give you a quick example. I had a client today. Mr. Grossman knows. He's already like, I know exactly who it is. I had a client today. Ended up, kept blowing up my phone, blowing up my phone, blowing up my phone, blowing up my phone. Finally, I just got on the phone and I was like, do you want me to sell your house or not? And this individual was like, what do you mean? I said, do you want me to sell your house or not? Well, yeah, I want you to sell my house. Then stop calling me. Stop calling me. I, yes, yes. I have enough going on that I am making magic work. I tell people this all the time. I can move mountains. I have made things happen that people thought could never happen. But what ends up happening is, is when I keep getting phone calls and a client wants to consistently wants to ask you every little thing about what's going on, there's a reason they hired you. There's a reason people hire you. So you deal with the little small things so they don't have to stress over it. When a client is consistently calling you, can you think straight, Colton? No, you can't. If your phone's ringing every five, 10 minutes, 
you can't think strategically of how you're going to do it. I work best when I'm left alone and I'm drawing out maps and thinking different things and all of this and running numbers and thinking about how I can set this up so that it's going to work perfectly and work strategically to our advantage. I don't need somebody micromanaging. I can make things happen where it's a win-win for everybody. You just got to trust me. And I do that sometimes. I tell my clients, you hired me to sell your house. Let me do what I do. But I also have to look out for the benefits of everybody else involved. I cannot be one-sided. I have to work for everybody. Of course, I'm going to look out for your interest in most. You're my client. But I have to look out for many different angles. Sometimes you have to have those discussions. It's your job, okay? Your job is to look out for your client at the best ability, but also using common sense. So again, those are some of the things that we end up, that we deal with as real estate agents, okay? Now, the thing is, that's going to cover the end of this lecture for tonight, okay? Uh, so tonight, our lecture is now officially over on that part.